Um, I want to talk a little bit about philosophy and the philosophy of persuading people and Jill, really what's at stake this fall. As you get older you get more philosophical so I'm going to have to bore you with that, I'm sorry. I want to start, you might say that the text for our sermon today is a quote from John Adams, our second president, and he said, we have no government armed with a power of capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, and licentiousness would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Right now, we are seeing a war against the Constitution. And I want to suggest that that war is the product of political leaders who display all of these evils that John Adams was talking about. And then I want to focus on the more difficult question of how do we win this war? To begin at the beginning, most of us here already understand that there's something great about America and that that greatness was from a vision of government crystallized in the Constitution. The great concept of inalienable rights was unique in history. Rights that no government could take away from you because it would be immoral for the government to do that. Equality of opportunity, another great concept that was alien to history where most of history was some were born with boots to ride on top of others. And most importantly, a government that was put into chains, the chains of the Constitution, to prevent the avarice and ambition of the office holders from destroying the country. That's what the Constitution was all about. We understand as Republicans that a critical part of the Constitution is limiting federal powers to a narrow list of powers, and that most of the power is supposed to be in the states or with the people. Now we have corrupt and unprincipled congressmen who insist on federalizing everything from local police, local education, forest management, everything. Our judges were supposed to limit this, but now we have a majority of judges who think the federal government has the power to do anything. They even want to stop us, stop states from controlling their own elections and stopping illegal aliens from voting. All of these officials that we have, nearly all of these officials, think that they were born with boots to ride us or milk us as some kind of tax cow for their own projects that they want to spend their money on. The left knows that the Constitution is the biggest thing in place that prevents them from taking over. To hold on to America, we have to hold on to the meaning of the Constitution and respect that it means what it says. So what do we see from the left? The New York Times had an article last week, and the article said that restrictions on government and I, this is a quote, serve as a foundation for a government that rules over people. Think about how diabolical that is. We have a government lording it over us all the time because they're not restrained, and the New York Times is out there saying that the problem is the Constitution. This is just backwards. This is a war against the Constitution. The left has been winning this war for my whole life. We say that free speech is a foundation of the free republic. They say it's an instrument of white supremacy now. We say that the Second Amendment is a foundation of the free republic because citizens without guns are not citizens, they're slaves. But now we have a majority of judges who don't believe that the First or Second Amendment means what they say. So what we have is one side that is defending the Constitution and one side that will stop at nothing to replace it. The Democrats will fight the appointment of any good federal judges like rabid badgers. They've completely corrupted the appointment process. We couldn't even get a good federal judge here in Oregon onto President Trump's desk. They took over public education a long time ago. Ronald Reagan, remember when he campaigned on eliminating the Department of Education, an unconstitutional department? He lost. The education professionals won. And now they're bankrupting Oregon and every other state. The public schools are now ruthlessly downplaying everything that is good or great about America and teaching all kinds of nonsense. Fifty-one percent of students now think it's acceptable to shout down a speaker that they disagree with. Twenty percent of students believe it's acceptable to use violence to prevent somebody from talking if you disagree with them. Think about what the young people of Portland are actually out there chanting on the streets. No borders, no walls, no USA at all. Think about how twisted you have to be to get to that place. 
and how much effort has gone into putting people in that place. Or the slogan, cops and Klan go hand in hand. The left has been out here developing these things for years. And having this young generation run around and call us and many other people fascists is just the beginning. The ultimate goal is to create a climate where leftist mobs will accept leftist commands to actually physically attack anyone who's deemed to be a fascist. You know, we've taken, we've taken some heat for standing up for Joey Gibson and his Patriot Prayer protests. And I want to say I don't approve of everything he's doing. I don't think they should be wearing t-shirts glorifying Pinochet who used to throw communists out of airplanes, any more than people should be wearing t-shirts celebrating Che Guevara, a mass murderer. But these Patriot Prayer folks, they've got guts, and they act like a magnifying glass that brings out the true nature of the left. And as they get do that, the American people get to see what the left is like. And they don't like violent and disorderly conduct. You might remember that Richard Nixon won his election in 1968 because there was a silent majority of Americans fed up with the disorder that the leftists had engendered in the country. And that's going to happen again if the left keeps pushing the way they're pushing. And it's not just the government that's gone now. Even the large corporations are now turning to the left. Facebook, Facebook and Google are now weapons of the left. They are diabolically restricting conservative views while pretending to be neutral platforms. You know, Facebook's algorithms have even flagged the Declaration of Independence as hate speech. Think about that. Think about how twisted you have to be to get to that place. There's a United States Senator from Connecticut who's one of these guys, and he recently tweeted, InfoWars is the tip of a giant iceberg of hate and lies that uses sites like Facebook and YouTube to tear our nation apart. The companies must do more than take down one website. The survival of our democracy depends on it. When you hear a leftist talk about our democracy, what they're talking about is what they will make after they destroy the Constitution and create a national socialist government just like another national socialist government in history, the one that Germany used to have. The elite scum, like this Senator Murphy, who've risen to the top in this country, they're united in one view. And that one view is too much free speech helped President Trump get elected, so we've got to do everything we can to shut down free speech by conservatives. So the things that we believe, like having a country and having borders and having equality of opportunity, that's hate speech now. And they're going to try and shut down that speech by any means necessary. And ultimately, if they can't outlaw it, they will begin attacking with violence and intimidation. So what do we do? Well, despite all these attacks on the Constitution, we're still in pretty good shape. If we don't work for the government or a large corporation, we can still say what we think. We still have enough to eat. We can look beyond the struggle to stay alive to some higher purpose. Now, many of us here are Christians, or at least we're trying to be Christians. And we know that the Constitution was written by Christians who knew that the kingdom of heaven sure wasn't going to be the product of a government. The Christian view, and it's the truth, is that people left to their own devices, tend to be immoral and wicked. It's a constant struggle that has to be won by each generation of parents and each generation of voters to bring up a new generation with good norms of behavior and not a lawless generation. When we win that struggle, the Constitution is safe. And when we lose that struggle, we lose the Constitution. And as Christianity declines, more and more people are filling this, th they, have a, they have like a hole in their head for a higher purpose, a higher calling. And they're filling it with belief systems that are not grounded in reality of truth. Whether it's communism or political, political correctness or intersectionality or any number of things, they'll fill their heads with these things and they're just plain wrong. They say on the one hand that people are inherently good. And on the other hand, people have to be improved and people have to be controlled so that they behave the way the elites want them to, and so they think the way the elites want them to. Our enemy has a powerful motivation. We cannot forget that these people waging war on the Constitution, they think they're the ones motivated by a higher purpose. They think they're going to make the world perfect, and it's their very quest for this purity and perfection that makes them dangerous, because 
people are imperfect. So the only way you can get to perfection is with a government of absolute power that doesn't let people be themselves. And so the left works day and night to destroy morality and re religion. And the worst part is, as they destroy morality and religion, then they bring about disorder. The greatest risk is that then even us, we look at this and we say, we've got to give the government more power to preserve order. That's not the right way to look at the problem. I want to say to you that what we really need to do is restore something like old-fashioned morality and religion, or we're going to lose it all. Now that doesn't mean what the left would say is some caricature. I'm not standing here advocating for a theocracy. It means that we need to see a return to good old American values. We need to explain to people what they were and why they were better. And that as Americans, what we believe in is in the right to be left alone and believe what we want to believe if we're not really hurting anybody. So what do we do? What do we do to spread good old American beliefs? Well, first thing we do is we pick our target. Now, the old Chinese proverb is that one-third are following the path of light, one-third are following the path of darkness, and one-third are just following. So we can see that in the Oregon voter registrations, right? You've got the Republican registrants, and you've got the Democrat registrants, and you've got those who are non-affiliated voters. Those are the three groups. Now, when you're out there talking to voters, you can't worry about the one-third following the path of darkness. You're not going to be able to convince them. You have to abandon any hope to make them change their minds. They are lost, perhaps in more senses than one. But remember, because we live in a democratic republic, our whole future depends on how that one-third who are just following vote. That's what it's all about. There's nothing more important than persuading the followers to follow us, right? Now, of course there's a problem. We know they don't like political parties because they didn't register for one. In fact, they're repelled by anything that smells like a partisan politics or a party. They want to see Americans coming together to solve problems and not attacking other people with labels. So how do we win the hearts and minds of this group? Well, let's go back to John Adams. What would a moral and religious people do? What does Christianity teach? It tells us to accept the Holy Spirit, and it tells us to act in truth and love. And I'm going to suggest to you that if we're going to win this war, we're going to win it by spreading the truth, but doing it in a loving way. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. You don't win hearts and minds by acting like jerks. <laughs> the first war we need to win when we're talking to these follow followers is over our own morality and our own self-control. You know, the Bible tells believers, put on a breastplate of righteousness, okay? But too often, we've allowed that breastplate of righteousness to repel these followers. And the forces of evil, of course, they know all about that. They've been laying the groundwork with the followers for a long time. For decades, the left has attacked Christianity as judgmental or shaming. But guess what? The left is now worse, far worse than Republicans. They're the ones behaving like the Spanish Inquisition or the Salem witch hunters. People are losing their jobs or suffering massive government fines just for standing up and disagreeing with the leftists. But what do I mean by self-control? Many of us, myself included, and I'm one of the worst offenders, we love to just stand up and rail on and on about the leftists and how bad they are, right? But when we're talking to people who aren't Republicans, we can't do that. We've got to focus on issues that they care about, maybe policy issues. And it's a, it's a hard job. When your mind is full of the truth and full of righteousness, it gets in the way of listening patiently to people, especially if they're just regurgitating a bunch of leftist talking points that have been programmed in there by the left, right? It's tough. It's tough to be patient. But we have to be gentle, and we have to bring people to the truth with gentle questioning to let them see the errors of the leftist way. I know you guys can do it. When I look out there, I see a party that's far more accepting and tolerant of differences than the Democrats of the left. I see a people that may see sinners when they look at people, but they don't get in people's faces about it because we're all sinners struggling in our own way to approve. So once we can get ourselves in this good, loving frame of mind, what does it mean to spread moral truth? And here's another area where I think we as Republicans are failing. What stirs people up to go to the polls is not some dry, abstract argument about 
tax efficiency or something like that. What stirs people up is questions of right and wrong. That's what gets people motivated, and the left knows this. That's why they indoctrinate all their people to look at us, oh look, it's the Nazis, it's going to be the end of the world if they take over. So we have to point things out from more of a moral perspective. And that, that's why we can win. Because the Republican side is the side that is aligned with the great moral truths. You know, most people aren't evil, okay? They have some moral sense. They can tell when people are behaving good or behaving badly. If they tell you Republicans are too judgmental, say, well, yeah, that happens, but gosh, both sides are like that. And really, the left are the ones acting like the new Puritans here with, with all the things that are going on. And people can see that. They can see the hypocrisy. So what do I mean by a moral perspective on policy? Well, let me give you an example. Let's start with a fundamental moral code. How about the Tenth Commandment? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or thy neighbor's wife or anything that is thy neighbor's. Nearly all of the leftist politics is about inciting that covetousness. The, they appeal to the evil of saying, we can just vote ourselves more money, we can vote to take away the property of the others, and that's, that's one of the biggest threats we face. Here's another horrifying statistic for you. 57%, no, more than half of young people have a positive image of socialism, and 57% of Democrats have a positive image of socialism. In the last two years, the support of younger Americans for capitalism has declined by 12%. But these people that we're talking to, they're smart enough to know that if your neighbor has a nice car and you don't, it's not right for you to steal it. And if they think about it and you ask them questions, they can realize that it's not all right for them to pass taxes so that they can take away the car and give somebody else more of a car. And they know when they look around that we have more and more transfer programs and we have housing programs and we have disability and we have all these programs, they do some good, but they know that there are a lot of people in those programs who don't need what they're getting and they're angry about it because they work hard, they don't get to keep their money, it goes off to a bunch of freeloaders. That's a moral problem and it's a problem that I don't hear a lot of candidates talking about, but it's a problem that will get people to go to the polls if they understand that we are the party that is going to fix that. We're the party of an equal opportunity economic system that lets individuals be all that they can be. As the candidate just said, the left is imposing more and more regulations and controls. They treat economics like dividing up a pie. And the problem is then there's any more pie and you're in Venezuela. And the, now, we're guilty too though, you know. There's a lot of Republicans out there who've been looting the bank, you know. And we have to admit that. We have to say, look, people aren't perfect, but two wrongs don't make a right. We're trying to move forward here. We're trying to make America great again, and we can't get bogged down in the mistakes of the path. past. Now, I'll tell you something. This moral perspective, it works for nearly every issue you can think of. Think about, um, think, you know, no leftist can tell you why it's fair for illegal immigrants to cut to the front of the line ahead of all the people who followed the rules. They can't explain that. We win that argument hands down. Leftists can't explain why we should feel more sorry for the children of the illegal aliens than for the children of American criminals. And no leftist can explain why it's moral to have such high taxes that here in Oregon and here in Portland, every apartment, every apartment, every renter must pay hundreds of dollars a month just in taxes. Where's the morality in that? Where's the morality in micromanaging every tiny bit of construction and land use and planning to the point where housing and everything costs three times as much as it should? And where's the morality of these people whose only answer is to pass more taxes and more programs so their friends can get rich building subsidized housing that then fills up with more people living at the expense of others? People can see these things if it's explained to them. They can see that their schools have become immoral because their schools are teaching things that the parents would revolt against if the parents only knew. And it's our job to tell them what's going on in the schools. Now, what about, what about the programming about racism and bigotry and sexism and all that? You are on the moral high ground. The Republican Party is the moral party, and the Democrats, underneath this facade of virtue signaling, they have the same rotten core the Democrats did back when they were the backbone of the KKK. It hasn't changed. Over and over again, 
the initiatives they push are racist to the core. The truth is, is that people are not really held back in this country because of their color or their sex. You look at the statistics, young women are radically outpacing young men in educational achievement. Asian Americans, like candidate Wang, they're outpacing white Americans because the skin color doesn't matter. And black immigrants, black immigrants to this country are making more money than native whites. All of these things that they say are not based on reality, and you can cite the statistics to show that. These, they're not saying these things because they're true. They're saying them as a tool to get more power. And these followers, these followers that we're talking to, they can recognize hypocrisy when they see it. You tell them about the time that the head of the Democratic National Committee was filmed like beating up his girlfriend or whatever it was, and that was just fine to reappoint him as the head of the DNC because, hey, it's all about power. It's not about the truth of any of this stuff. Now, one final moral truth we need to spread, and this is one of the most popular positions that nobody is talking about, is that we are failing to control corruption. Many within our own Republican-controlled Justice Department and our Republican-controlled FBI and our Republican-controlled Congress, they're creating legions of swamp creatures whose evil deeds are not punished at all. You know their names, Clinton, Comey, Brennan, Rosenstein, McCabe, Sturzak, Page, Orr. The list goes on and on and on, and we are failing because we're not demanding that our leaders do anything about it. And this is a real serious problem that the mushy middle, these followers, they see that too. And it's a more serious problem than you can imagine. You know, Al Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who spent a lot of time in the gulag and knows a whole lot more about human good and evil than, than most of us, he said, when we don't punish evildoers, we're not just protecting their trivial old age. We are ripping the foundations of justice from beneath new generations. So when you're out talking to these unaffiliated voters this fall, help them understand we recognize we're not perfect, but there's only one solution. There's only one solution for every one of the problems we have. And that's getting rid of bad public officials and replacing them with good ones. You know, we can go to public meetings, we can write letters to the bad public officials, we can go to town halls and tell them what we think, but, you know, the truth of it is, nothing gets better until you get rid of the bad public officials. There is nothing else that's that important. That's what we've got this fall. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we need to achieve. So the stakes, the stakes are very high this November. It's up to each of us to talk to that one third of Oregon that's just following. It's a culture of ideas. It's here, it's now. It's not the newspapers, it's not the internet. It's you and I talking to our neighbors in a way that spreads the truth in a loving way, one voter at a time. That's what's going to make a difference this fall. That's what I hope you're getting out there and doing. Thank you very much.